We left off the previous uh, slide by talking about that a sputum culture is necessary to confirm the diagnosis of tuberculosis. So let's jump ahead to um, how we collect sputum. Sputum comes from deep within the lungs, so make sure that the patient understands that they're not just spitting into the container. We don't want um, spit. We want nasty stuff that they harf up from deep inside. So usually the um, you have them take three deep breaths and then cough deeply, and that's what we want into the sterile specimen container. 15 milliliters is what is needed. Early morning before breakfast is best. You don't want to get a lot of mouth bacteria contaminating your sample, so um, have them brush their teeth first or um, rinse their mouth out. So we don't want food in here, and we just want sputum and again the reason that early morning is best is because it's had a chance to kind of sit there and um, stagnate all night nasty as that sounds here's a sample question from about sputum specimen collection um, the nurse is preparing to obtain a sputum specimen which nursing action is essential have the client take deep, three deep breaths well i said that limit fluids no that's not necessary ask the client to obtain specimen after eating no it'll have food in it Ask the client to spit. No, we don't want them spit to spit. So that's your answer right there. Pulse oximetry is something I'm sure you're all familiar with now that you've been doing clinicals for one term. It's just um, when I was in nursing school, we called it the ET finger because it makes your finger glow red like ETs. But it's just that simple. You can also put it on the forehead or earlobe, but usually we put it on one of the fingers. 95 to 100% is normal. So anywhere between 90% and 94, we don't consider normal. That's low, but we also don't get real excited and think, oh my goodness, I need to prepare to call a code blue over that either. Less than 90% is usually when we think about calling the doctor unless um, we have been given other parameters. Want to make sure that when you have someone hooked to the what we call the nurse on wheels or what the automatic vital sign taker that you put the Pull socks on the opposite side of the blood pressure cuff. Otherwise, every time the blood pressure cuff pumps up, it'll cut off circulation and throw your pull socks off. Things that can interfere with accurate measurement of pull socks are hypotension, so low blood pressure. If someone doesn't have adequate blood pressure to perfuse those fingers, you're not going to get um, a good reading. Hypothermia, so low temperature. If someone's fingers are very, very cold, you're not going to get an accurate reading. We have to warm those fingers up. Vasoconstriction and then finally finger movement. That's usually the most common thing that throws these off are, are when the patients are moving their fingers around. So we have to make sure that they understand that whatever finger we put the pulse socks on, they need to try to keep that still while we're monitoring their pulse oximetry. Here is a sample question from your workbook. Which factor interferes with the accurate measurement of the pulse ox oximeter? Well, of all of these, it would, I would say the hypotension, and again, m movement wasn't a choice, um, being cold, it has hyperthermia instead of hypothermia, vasoconstriction would be um, interfering with accurate measurement rather than vasodilation. The use of an arterial blood gas or ABG is way more accurate than pulse oximetry for determining how well someone's blood is oxygenated. And you should also remember from last term that we use these to determine whether someone's in alkalosis or acidosis. Arterial blood gases, just as it implies, is drawn from an artery rather than a vein, and so it takes special training. You will not receive that training in PN school, and I didn't receive that training in RN school either. Usually, respiratory therapists will draw these or a phlebotomist who's had special training. Some things to keep in mind when ABGs are being drawn, we have to document the temperature, how many, that's the client's temperature, how many liters of O2 they are on. So a phlebotomist will often ask you what the patient's temperature was. And then after they have this done, pressure is applied for five to 10 minutes because since it's an artery, it can bleed pretty easily. One of the things that we are supposed to do before this test is performed is to perform what's called this Allen's test. You can see this is on a child. The um, practitioner is occluding the ulnar and the radial arteries. These are the two main arteries that supply the hand. Once that is done, the hand will start to turn blue because circulation has been cut off. Then you release the radial because that's the one that you're going to stick. And when you, re I mean, you, 
you keep the radial compressed, I think I said that wrong, release the ulnar artery, blood should flow back into the hand and that tells you that their ulnar artery is patent and it's good. What we don't want to do is if the only thing that's causing circulation to their hand is the radial artery and then we go and stick it and have to hold pressure on it for 10 to 15 minutes, then that's going to cut off the circulation to their hand for that long and we don't want to do that. So that's why we do an Allen test to make sure this ulnar artery is good and that they will be able to get perfusion to their hand um, during and after the procedure. An art line is sometimes put in somebody that's going to have frequent ABGs drawn. You'll see these in ICU. And so this enables the RN to um, draw blood from the artery anytime we want to. And then it has this little valve on it that we can close off. So that makes it to where the RNs don't have to have the special training to hit an artery and that the patient isn't stuck constantly to get these ABGs. After it's drawn, the sample is either put on ice or if there's a portable ABG machine, the results come out stat. I, I told you that if a phlebotomist does this, they'll just tear off this little, looks like a little receipt, hand it to you and tell you to have a nice day. If it's a respiratory therapist that draws it, then they might go over it with you. But ultimately, it needs to be reported to the physician. So pop quiz, <coughs> do you remember these values? Uh, CO2? Hopefully you remembered um, normal 35 to 45, HCO3. We had two different sources. One said 22 to 26. I think your book said 22 to 28. pH, if you can remember the pH or the CO2, it helps you remember the pH. You just put a 7 point in front of it, 7.35 to 7.45. O2 sat, just talked about that. 95 to 100 is normal. Less than 90, probably going to call the physician. This one... I told you doesn't really have a lot to do with um, determining acid-base imbalances, but it is going to be important now that we're in the respiratory system. So 80 to 100 is normal. Anything less than 60, we consider acute respiratory distress. And so that 60 to 80 range is iffy. That's where um, certainly not normal, but it's not um, needing to prepare to call a code blue or anything like that. I'm sorry if you thought you were all done with these because you're not. So which arterial blood gas indicates metabolic alkalosis? Well, I like to do the alkalosis first. That means I need a pH higher than 7.45. Um, and really, there's only one. Um, this one's at the top of the range. But also, metabolic alkalosis implies that if my pH is high, that means my HCO3 also has to be high. And I look here, and sure enough, it is. So that would be my answer. ABG findings that should be reported to the physician if they occur in patients with impaired gas exchange include. So first we have PO2 decreases. And definitely if someone's oxygen decreases, that's a bad sign. So knowing that, that limits my choices to either this one or this one. Because in the other two, the PO2 is increasing and we don't really mind if someone has extra oxygen in their blood. So let's look at these two, the difference between these two. This one says PO2 decreases and pH increases. Well, that implies alkalosis, and what we're really worried about respiratory-wise is that respiratory acidosis. So in this one, PO2 decreases and the carbon dioxide increases, and we know that's classic respiratory acidosis going on right there. So that's why that one was our answer. A pneumonia client suddenly becomes restless. ABGs are drawn and reveal oxygen of 60. Now remember I told you that 80 to 100 and when we're doing ABGs is what oxygen should be. And when it gets to 60 or below, we consider that um, acute respiratory distress. So we've got a big problem here. So what problem is it? Well, they're not effectively exchanging their oxygen and carbon dioxide. So um, that would be our, our last choice there. Client with a history of respiratory disease is admitted to the hospital with respiratory failure. The nurse reviews the ABGs for which results that are consistent with this disorder. Again, go back to what I told you. Respiratory failure is less than, hopefully you said, 60. And so we eliminate this choice here and this choice here because it's um, 60 and above. So let's look at this 58 and 49. I'm less concerned about this one because... I mean, I'm less concerned about this one. Just a second. 
I was going too fast. In this one, the CO2 at 32, that's actually lower than normal. So we don't have that case where the carbon dioxide is displacing the oxygen. But in this one, here we have a low oxygen value, less than 60, far less than 60, and we also have a high carbon dioxide level. So here we're having displacement. The carbon dioxide is displacing the oxygen. So that's why that's of greater concern. We've covered a lot of the tests that are commonly done for respiratory problems. Some of the tests are also considered therapeutic measures, such as the thoracentesis. If we do a thoracentesis because we want to get a sample of fluid and run it to lab, then it's, it would fall in the category of being a lab, but sometimes we do a thoracentesis to remove the fluid. So something like that falls into both categories as being both a lab and a common therapeutic measure. But here I have some of the others, and this will take us quite some time to get through because we're going to cover each one of these um, breathing exercises, chest PT, suctioning, humidification, oxygen therapy, artificial airways, mechanical ventilation, chest tubes, and thoracic surgery. And like I said, this is going to take us a long time to get through all of this. So we'll start with breathing exercises. Of course, if you have respiratory therapists where you work, the respiratory therapist takes care of a lot of this. However, nursing is also involved, especially in the post-op patient. Um, turn, cough, deep breathe is something that nurses just kind of have memorized when they get out of nursing school. The purpose of the turn, cough, deep breathe uh, really serves two purposes, to aid in lung expansion and also to aid in the expectoration of respiratory secretions. So lung expansion, all these little microscopic alveoli, they can collapse. And so when we um, have our patients take deep breaths, it keeps these alveoli open. When they collapse, we call that atelectasis. And then also the cough removes these secretions that can accumulate in the bronchioles. So the turn cough, deep breathe, very important, especially for your post-op patient or anyone who is um, immobilized. We need to make sure, sometimes we have to instruct our patients on that. So typically what you do, um, have the patient take four to six really deep breaths. We have those breaths are inhaled through the nose pause for one to three seconds and then exhale slowly through the mouth and so one way to remember that is to think you're going to smell the birthday cake hold it and then blow out the candles and then after they take four to six deep breaths then they're going to cough deeply kind of like they would when if they were trying to give you a sputum specimen from real deep of course if they've had any kind of chest or abdominal surgery this can hurt, so um, splinting helps. It um, uses counter pressure to ease the pain, or we also use medication. If you have someone who's constantly rating their pain at an eight or nine, they're not wanna, going to want to do these coughing and deep breathing exercises. So that's why it's important to give our patients adequate pain relief so that they don't just sit there and um, develop pneumonia because they're afraid to take a deep breath. Pursed lip breathing exercises are often taught to patients with COPD that have that tr chronic trapping of carbon dioxide, and it's a good way to blow off extra carbon dioxide that can relieve some types of dyspnea. So again, it's similar to what I just said. You um, smell the birthday cake, blow out the candles. Your exhale needs to be twice as long as your inhale. So here the man is inhaling for two seconds, exhaling for four, and inhales through the nose, exhales through the mouth, and they can do this several times. And pursed lips just means, see how his lips are puckered up? That's what that means. So these are called pursed lip breathing exercises. It's a way to eliminate a little extra CO2. This is a picture of an incentive spirometer. It's a handy little device that patients are often giving, given after they have surgery. And there's no plugs, no batteries. All it does is provide some visible feedback to the patient because a lot of times when we tell them, okay, you need to turn, cough, and deep breathe, patients don't really know what that is. Even if we tell them you need to take four to six deep breaths, well, that doesn't really quantify what a deep breath is. And so what this does is as a patient breathes in, they have to um, put their mouth around this little mouthpiece and make sure it's airtight and as they um, breathe in real deeply it causes this disc to rise and you this little yellow thing right here you can set goals for your patient so usually we set the goal 600 to 900 or and an even better way is to have them use this before their surgery see how high they can get 
that and make that your goal for post-op. Anyway, it gives the patient something visual to look at so that they know when they've taken a deep breath or when they're not quite meeting that goal. And so the way that they do this, similar to the deep breathing that I talked about earlier, but they are going to inhale through the mouthpiece, try to make their goal, hold it for a few seconds, and then exhale. They do this.